Good morning and welcome to MIE. We welcome all visitors and uh, our regular people that come on a Sunday morning. Um, we provide a warm welcome virtually over the airwaves um, as we can't be doing that in person. I'm Mark and I attend St Andrews and you'll see me around in the evening services sometimes. Um, I'm going to start this morning with a passage from the Bible, the first part of Psalm 33, which says, Let the godly sing with joy to the Lord, for it is fitting to praise him. Praise the Lord with melodies on the lyre, make music for him on the ten-stringed harp. Sing new songs of praise to him, play skillfully on the harp and sing with joy. For the word of the Lord holds true, and everything he does is worthy of our trust. And if you'd like to join me in worship this morning with a lot of our skillful musicians, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here.
Father God, we thank you that we can gather in your name. Even though we are far apart, we are close by your spirit. We come now together as a congregation to declare our sins and to affirm our faith. In your name, Lord. Amen. Please join us as we confess our sins. Uh, there'll be a point where we need to say bits together. They will appear on the screen. And I'll also keep a moment of silence after the first part. So let's join together. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call, Call upon, upon him, him while he, he is near. near. Let the wicked abandon their ways and, and the, the unrighteous, unrighteous their thoughts. thoughts. Turn back to the Lord who will have mercy. To, to our God, God who, who will richly pardon. pardon. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image. To the praise and glory of his name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessed be the Lord, who, who has, has heard, heard the, the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy. And in, in our, our song, song will we praise our God. God. Please join us in our next song by declaring our faith. This I believe.
what? We're having a video call with Fluffy today. Look. It's nice to see Fluffy because he's your friend and he's good at helping you with problems. But you feel shy about talking on the screen. That's OK. I can help you talk. And I think that Fluffy gets shy about being on the screen, too. Yes, he does. So I sometimes help him talk. It's OK to feel shy. It's strange having to see our friends in this way. Who's that lady? It's Lizzie. She's Fluffy's friend. Fluffy is lucky to have such a nice friend. Yes, he is. You want to know how Larch is? Fluffy says, how are you? And he wants to know what you've been doing. You're OK. You've been playing on Mario Kart. Doing your schoolwork. You shouldn't yawn about that. And getting confused. What are you confused about? Why do you need another dad? What do you mean? You've been reading in your Bible and it said the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. Fluffy, it's not kind to laugh at our friends. And it talks about being led by the spirit and being children of God. <laughs> no, Larch, it's not talking about grandma's whiskey. We read this bit this week as well. Yes, we did. And it confused you too, didn't it, Fluffy? And we talked about it. And that's right, I told you that it's talking about the Holy Spirit, which is part of God. That's right. And that it's not that we're going to be adopted and go to live with a different family. Yeah, that's right. And we're not going to have grandma's whiskey. Definitely not. That's right. It means like we're adopted by God and he calls us his children, which is awesome. That's why it said we can call him daddy. That's right, Larch. So when you pray and it feels like you're talking to thin air, it's actually like talking to your daddy. That's right. Yes. And as the Holy Spirit is God and is with us, it means that when we pray, the Holy Spirit is helping us and talking with us to God the Father. That's awesome. It really is. It makes you want to praise God. It certainly does. Can we sing about how big and awesome God is? Good idea. Should we sing, Our God is a Great Big God?
reading is taken from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 17. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Well, one of the things that's happening as we're working our way through this Jesus-centered life term, looking at the life and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, one of the things that we're doing is building up a picture of what it looks like for a church to be in step with the Spirit. What what, what the Spirit wants to do in the life of a church, or, or to put it slightly differently, the things that will characterize a church when the Spirit is free, when the Spirit has his way with the people of God. What are the things that become important in the life of a church like that? You know, you step into the life of the church. How, how do you know? How do you know if this is a church that is filled with the Spirit, that is in step with the Spirit? Or, or let's, let's bring the question right home to roost. How would we know that MIE was a church that was filled with the Spirit, that was in step with the Spirit? You, know, you don't walk into a church and see the Spirit. But it's, it's like Jesus in John 3 when he's talking to Nicodemus and he says, Look, you don't see the wind, but you see the effects of the wind. You see the impact that the wind has. Well, it's like that with the church a church life. You don't, you, don't, you don't see the Spirit, but you see the evidence of the Spirit at work. You see the impact that the, the Spirit is having in the life and the mission of that church. Now, we need to be really careful on this because it's very easy for us to have developed our own personal checklist um, of the things that we think, well, of course, I know if the Spirit is at work in a church, it's going to look like this, it's going to sound like this. And, well, we just need to make sure that the things that we think are actually things that resonate with what the Bible teaches. And it's one of the things that we're doing together in this series is that we're, we're searching the scriptures uh, together and, and asking, well, what does God say in his word will be the evidence of the spirit at work? He's not leaving us to guess. You know, let's just make our best guess on this. He says, look, no, no, if my spirit is, is at work, these are the things that you can expect to see in the life of the church. And we've already begun to build that picture up, haven't we? A couple of weeks ago, uh, we were looking at Titus chapter 3 and the way in which the Spirit loves to bring people to know Jesus. He loves to bring people to Jesus, to show them who Jesus is so that they put their trust in Him and faith in Him. They, they give their lives to Him. They bow before Him as Lord and as Savior. And, and that's something that we see all the way through the book of Acts, where the Spirit loves to bring people to Jesus to be saved by Him. You know, we see it in the, book, in the book of Acts, don't we? When, the, when the, the Spirit is poured into the life of the church, one of the things that, that characterizes the church in the book of Acts is massively committed to evangelism, both formally, you've got people, as it were, standing up and proclaiming Christ, but actually just people going about, wherever they go, they're, they're spreading the gospel, talking about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and inviting people into relationship with the Lord Jesus. And we're told that the Lord adds to their number, sometimes daily. It's interesting as you read through the book of Acts how often Luke takes a step back from telling the story just to say, oh, and th this, this number of people became Christians, or we saw loads of people from this group becoming Christians. It's just, you know, that's what happens when the Spirit has His way with the church. You're going to see a church that is deeply committed and involved in uh, evangelism, proclaiming Christ, and you're going to see the Spirit bringing people to know Jesus as Lord and as Savior. 
And last week, we were looking at the whole question of the, the, the way in which the Spirit wants to cultivate holiness in the people of God. He doesn't just love bringing people to Jesus, but then he wants to get a work on us and transform us and conform us to the image of Jesus. And again, we see that again and again through the Bible. And, you know, particularly in the letters in the New Testament, you, you've got these guys who are like uniquely inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is really working at, at shaping what they say and what they teach uh, into the life of the church. And, and over and over again, you see these guys inspired by the Spirit and they're urging and teaching and instructing and calling people and challenging people to, to become more like Jesus. So Paul puts it like this in Ephesians 4. He talks about how you know, we're, we're to put off our old selves, our former way of life, and we're to put on a new self that is created to be like God in, in true righteousness and, and holiness. So already, just a couple of weeks in, and we're beginning to see um, what the Spirit loves to do in the life of the church. A, a church that is filled with the Spirit, a church that is in step with the Spirit, is a church that is committed to evangelism, where we're going to see people becoming Christians and, and then growing to become more like the Jesus that they are looking to as Lord and as Savior. Those things are going to be high priorities in the life of a Spirit-filled church. And this week, we get to put another piece of the puzzle in place, something else that is so close to the heart of the Spirit, uh, something else that he, he weaves into the life of any church where he has his way, and it is, of course, uh, prayer. Uh, and again, you know, we see this all the way through the Bible. At one point, the Spirit is actually called the Spirit of supplication. You know, he's, that's just a Bible word that means you know, praying out loud. Um, but that, that's so close to what the Spirit wants to do in the life of a church. He, that's actually, it's actually like a title that he's given. He is the Spirit of Supplication. And, and you know, you see it, of course, in the life of Jesus as well, don't you? And he is the man of the Spirit. He is the one who is anointed with the Spirit without limit. Well, as you read through the Gospels, just see what a significant part of the life of of Jesus is given over to prayer. And again, we see it in the book of Acts, don't we? As the, as the church is baptized with the Spirit, the Spirit is poured into the life of the church. One of the first things that we're told in Acts chapter 2 is that the church devoted themselves, they devoted themselves to prayer. And again, as we read through the book of Acts, we see what that actually means. Like I'm sure people had their own sort of personal prayer lives. But in the book of Acts, what we see again and again is, is the church coming together to pray. I mean, that's what the Spirit loves to do. He loves to bring people together and then together in unity and in fellowship with one another. He brings them through Jesus to the, to the Father um, and, and cultivates that relationship, that fellowship both with God and with one another in the life of the church. And, and that shapes the kind of prayer that Christians devote themselves to. Spirit-filled Christians, a spirit-filled church, is a church that is devoted to coming together to pray. So you see it in Acts, in Acts chapter 4. You know, Peter and John, they've been arrested, they've been interrogated, they're beaten, they're, they're released. Uh, it's, it's the church's like first taste of persecution in the book of Acts. And, and what do they do? Well, they do what they've devoted themselves to. They, they have a prayer meeting. Uh, you see it again in Acts chapter 12. Uh, Peter's been imprisoned. What does the church do? They do what they're committed to doing as spirit-filled Christians, as a spirit-filled church. We're told in Acts chapter 12, verse 12, many people had gathered and were praying. And it's something that the church is taught to do again and again and again in the New Testament. Uh, Paul tells the church at Rome, be faithful in prayer. Uh, Romans 12, uh, verse 12. In 1 Corinthians, you've got a situation where, where people are so exclusively devoting themselves to prayer that Paul's having to sort of pass them and say, okay, all right, that's great, but actually what does that look like for family life and stuff like that, you know? 
Uh, Paul teaches the Ephesians. He says, like, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Be alert. Always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And see the way in which prayer dominates the life and the experience of the church. He says it again in Philippians. In every situation, by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And in Colossians chapter 4, uh, Paul calls for the same attitude to prayer uh, in the church at Colossae that we saw in the church in Jerusalem back in Acts chapter 2. He says, devote yourselves to prayer. Right? That wasn't just something that, you know, oh, well, you know, there was this initial burst of enthusiasm at the start of the book of Acts, but then, you know, that died off and everything settled down. No, no, <clears throat> it's supposed to characterize the, the church anywhere and at any time when the Spirit has his way, when the Spirit is allowed to shape the life of the church, it will be a church that is devoted to prayer. And maybe the most famous verse in the New Testament on this, of course, is 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. that just simply says, pray continually. That's such an important verse. I've actually done a whole separate video for that, which you can see on, uh, on my blog. Now, look, we've set this in this first part of, of the sermon today. We, we've set the scene. And I hope you begin to get a, a sense of the way in which the Spirit loves to bring the church together for the purpose of prayer and intercession and supplication. Right? That is so, so close to the heart of the Spirit. And when He gets His way in the life of the church, prayer is something that characterizes every aspect of that church's life and ministry and mission. I hope you're getting a sense of the priority of this uh, throughout the New Testament. And in just a couple of minutes, I'll come back and we'll, we'll really just camp out in Romans 8. And, and have a look at what that might have to teach us about what it means to pray in the Spirit.
Well, one of the dangers of really facing up to what the Bible has to teach us about prayer and the, uh, the sense of what it is the Spirit wants to embed in the life of our church together, well, one of the dangers is that we end up feeling uh, probably more condemned than inspired. Yeah, and so what I want to do with you in this second uh, part of the talk today is to reflect a little bit on just three or four verses out of Romans chapter 8 uh, that might just change our perspective and, and help us to feel more encouraged, more inspired, and more excited about what God wants to do in us and through us in our life of prayer than perhaps we may be default to. So just two or three passages out of Romans 8. Romans 8 verse 15. The spirit that you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. And then just drop down to verses 26 and 27, where we read that the spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And as if that's not enough, just drop down to verse 34, where we read that Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Well, with those passages at the forefront of our minds, just just two or three things for us to uh, meditate on together. And the first is, is to notice how utterly indispensable the presence, the indwelling of the Spirit is before we can pray at all. Even the most primal Christian prayer, speaking to God as our Father. You see, we need the Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of adoption, to ca catch us up into Jesus and into the, the dynamics of his relationship with his Father. And it's only as we share in that that we are able to come to God and say, Our Father. See, even before we can say the Lord's Prayer, we need the Spirit of Jesus dwelling within us. And the second thing to notice is that prayer is something that the Bible sees as rooted in real life, in, 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 in our daily struggle, in the pain and in the uncertainty, in the confusion of our experience of discipleship in this fallen, cursed uh, creation. You know, prayer isn't something that we just keep for, for the days when everything is running according to plan. You know, it's, it's not something that we, we keep for an ideal world or an ideal set of circumstances, you know, where it's okay for, like, monks and stuff, because they live in monasteries, and we live out here in the real world, and how are we supposed to be able to pray? Well, well Paul, like, no, 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 no. Th that, this here, this is exactly where prayer needs to take root, and this is where the Spirit is at work in us and through us to make us a people of prayer. All right? The, the whole thing is that, you know, you read in Romans 8, creation, Romans 8 verse 22, all of creation is groaning under uh, the curse. And, and as we become Christians, we, we kind of resonate with that. We line up with that. And then we become people who are groaning uh, as well. Verse, verse 26. You know, our, our, our life is overshadowed by sin and, and sickness and suffering and, and sadness and struggle and death and degeneration and decay. And, 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 and so often, you know, we just don't know what to pray. We don't know how to pray. Or, or maybe we're just like overwhelmed by the circumstances of life and we can barely hold a train of thought together, let alone get on our knees and articulate a coherent prayer to our Father. Well, it's precisely at those moments of incoherence, those moments of wordless groaning, that the Spirit's ministry of prayer in us and through us finds its, its deepest expression. And we need to be careful. Right? We're not saying that the Spirit is a substitute praying instead of us. No, no, the Spirit is coming and praying through us and through our 
prayer. Even when that prayer is, is wordless, when it's agonizing, when it's struggle, even, I guess, even when we're praying the wrong thing, the Spirit in His grace and in His wisdom is praying through us in accordance with God's will, in accordance with God's vision for what He is wanting to do in the circumstances of our life that we are enduring. This, yeah, yeah, look, the Spirit is wanting us to grow and to develop the mind of Christ. But while we are in that process, um, even, when, even when we don't know what to pray, how to pray as we ought to, the Spirit is kind of covering our back. He's at work in us and through us and praying for the things that we would pray for if we too knew the mind of God. See, through all our confused stammerings and, and, and stutterings and, and even the times when all we can do is grow. The Spirit is at work praying through us as we strive to pray. But the third thing, and, and in a way this is the most important thing, the thing that I really want you to, to, to grasp today, um, to take away from this service, is that when we are praying, do you see from these verses that we read from Romans 8 just how deeply engaged and involved the whole Trinity, the whole life of God is when, as the people of God, we, as it were, get on our knees to, to pray? Uh, and this is so important. I've actually put a whole, a whole other video on the blog for you to have a little bit more of a think about this. But, but here in, in verse 27, Romans 8 verse 27, we're told that the Father and the Spirit are both engaged. And then verse 34, the Son, Christ Jesus himself, is, is not only mediating our prayer to the Father. He's actually at the right hand of the Father, praying for us alongside, supplementing, as it were, our prayer. Or maybe it's better to think of our prayer as supplementing His, actually. He's there. He's, he's uh, risen and ascended and glorified. And He's praying for us. And there's something that is so precious here for us, isn't there? That, you know, that, that from God's perspective, us praying developing our, our relationship with him. It, it's so important that he doesn't leave us to it on our own. It's like, right, you guys, off you go. You go figure it out. No, no, the Spirit is there. The Son is there. The Father is there with us, working with us, intimately involved with us so that actually we are being caught up into, we are joining in with something that God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is actually already doing continually and continuously. He is doing this in us, through us, and for us. You see, when we come in prayer, we are caught up into the life of the Trinity and into the conversation of the Trinity. When we pray, we are becoming part of a conversation that's already going on within the life of God. I think about that. Doesn't that shape our whole approach to prayer in a, in a, in a very different kind of way? You know, it, it, for a start, I think it breeds, it breeds a deep humility in us. You know, we don't just barge in on this conversation that's going on between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. It's like, right, all you lot, be quiet. You need to listen to me because I know, I know what needs to be said. I know what needs to be done. No, no, no. If we understand what it means for us to come to God in prayer, then in humility we will stop and we will listen. And, and we will want to understand the conversation that is already going on so that we can kind of align to that and join it. It's why when the disciples come to Jesus and say, oh, Jesus, teach us to pray. Jesus doesn't say, well, you just come on in and you just tell, tell me everything or tell my father everything that, that, that you think is important, that, that's really burdening you. No, no, he, he actually, what he does in the Lord's Prayer is he is teaching us how to pray in a way that 
resonates with the conversation that is all already going on within the life of God about the people of God uh, and about the, the priorities and the, the dynamics of that conversation and the agenda that is shaping that conversation and teaching us how to kind of line up with that conversation and to join in with that conversation on its terms. All right, now, we learn then to share the concerns of the God with whom we are now speaking as we come in prayer. Now, how, how do we do that? How do we know what that conversation is about? Well, we learn about it in the Bible. We've already just thought uh, there about how Jesus teaches us how to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Actually, we're being taught how to pray in a number of different places in the Scripture. Some of the Psalms, for example, they are teaching us how to come before God, what to pray about, how to pray about certain situations and circumstances that we may face as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. But actually, it's, it's even more general than that. It's broader than that, isn't it? If you think about a, a little child, how does a, how does a baby as they're growing up, how does a baby learn to speak? Well, they're listening all the time, aren't they? They're listening, usually to their parents, but to others as well, as they speak and as they listen to the way in which parents speak to them and about them, so that child learns how to speak properly. And I think there's something of that that goes on as we study the scriptures. We're listening to the word of God and we're learning how to speak like God and how to speak to God in a way that reflects the agenda and the priorities of the conversation that is already going on within the life of God. I mean, it's a little bit what, what we're doing in this series, isn't it? As we study the Spirit, the life of the Spirit, the, the ministry of the Spirit, the things the Spirit wants to do in the life of the church. We're learning the things that are important to the Spirit, and that teaches us the things that we need to be praying about. Evangelism, and people becoming Christians, and people growing to become more like Jesus. Uh, praying, as we go through the series, praying for unity and fellowship, and for our experience of God, and our intimacy with God, and our being sustained in our faith in the midst of suffering, and our, our aspiring to and longing for the new creation. These are all things that the Spirit wants to engender in our prayer life as a church. And we'll see all that as the series unfolds. So when, when the Spirit prays with us and through us, we're beginning to learn some of the things that the Spirit is wanting to be praying about as we struggle in this fallen creation, in this cursed creation, to live as faithful disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it's not just, it's not just that we pray. And that's, in a way, that's, that's not, even that's not quite what the Spirit's aspiring for and wanting to achieve in us. Not just that we pray. It's about how we pray and what we pray. And I think if we can grasp that, I, I wonder if it might not change quite dramatically our approach to prayer. Um, what we pray then and how we pray about it, the atmosphere of our prayer, and the experience of prayer that increasingly characterizes us as individuals and as a church. Our prayers today are based on an old hymn written over 100 years ago, but the words are particularly relevant for today. For God holds the key of all unknown, and I am glad. If other hands should hold the key, or if he trusted it to me, I might be sad. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come to you once again in this time of uncertainty which is sweeping throughout our world. We thank you that despite this we have the assurance that you remain constant and are in control, and ready to accept our praise and to hear our requests. At this time, we bring before you the families who have lost loved ones due to this pandemic or through other causes. We pray for those currently fighting the virus 
and for those who are caring for them in difficult circumstances. We pray for all those within the medical and caring professions that they may be given the health and strength as they care for those who are unwell. We pray too for the hospital chaplaincy team as they seek to offer spiritual guidance and support to the staff, that this may be a way of introducing you to them and resulting in their acceptance of your way of salvation. We give thanks for the dedication of those who meet our physical needs in so many and varied ways. What if tomorrow's cares were here without its rest? I'd rather he unlocked the day, and as the hours swing open say, my will is best. We pray for our Prime Minister and those who have responsibility for overseeing the proposed gradual easing of the current lockdown, that they will turn to you for wisdom and guidance. May we too take responsibility for our own actions. The world is a very different place now, and whilst we are blessed to be able to use modern technology to still worship together, albeit remotely, we remember those for whom even this is not possible, where communication is monitored by hostile authorities. The very dimness of my sight makes me secure, for groping in my misty way I feel his hand, I hear him say, my help is sure. Romans 8 verse 26 says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. The present situation has prevented the usual ways of our evangelistic outreach amongst all our age groups, but we thank you that this is still possible by other means and so commend to you the current MIE courses which are still taking place and for those responsible for their leadership. I cannot read his future plans, but this I know. I have the smile in his face and all the refuge of his grace while here below. At this time we commend to you our mission partners at home and abroad and particular concerns they may have. Help them not to become discouraged, but to look to you and be assured of the prayerful support of their church behind them as they seek to serve others and lead them to you. Many in our MIE family may be fearful regarding their future and what they may face with worries and concern over employment, finances, health, education or family and relationships. So we bring these situations to you. Enough, this covers all my wants and so I rest. For what I cannot, he can see, and in his care I saved shall be forever blessed. We thank you for Mark, our vicar, Liz and the boys, and for the care and concern they have for us all. We are thankful for the vast amount of material which is constantly being produced to encourage and sustain us whilst we are no longer able to meet together. We pray too for the whole MIE family and all those for whom they care. We thank you for the spirit of love and support which is evident as we seek to support one another in these challenging times. We look forward to the time when we can all meet together to worship you in our different locations at St John's, St Andrew's and Bixley Farm. But we thank you that we are all united in you. As we conclude our time of prayer, we ask that the Lord may bless you and protect you. May he smile on you and be gracious to you, show you his favour and give you his peace. Amen. 
Uh, as we come to the end of our service this morning, I'd like to say some massive thank yous to the team of people that put these videos together week after week. It must take a lot of energy and a lot of effort. Um, and I'd just like to say thank you, but also to Henry Kent, who I understand takes a huge role in editing and putting the songs together. Um, so my thanks go to him. At the end of the service, please feel free to grab yourself a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or a juice and a biscuit. And it's time to share fellowship. Whether you live in a family, you can share fellowship together. If you do live by yourself, please grab a phone and share some fellowship over the airwaves. If you are a family and you know someone who is alone, please give them a call so they can share some fellowship with you. Please join us as we sing our last song, a great hymn, How Great Thou Art. See you soon. Bye.